Today I'll be speaking about eunuchs as a pre-modern gendered subject and the test which they uh, pose to our existing understandings of materialist feminism. I'm aware that uh, many of you won't be um, that current with medieval history, and so I'll begin by reintroducing some hopefully more familiar territory, the three theses of Cinzia Arusa, before delving into the particulars of Byzantine gender relations. And I'm hoping here to help show that resolving the patriarchy question requires considering pre-modern gender relations, and also how uh, this kind of gender history in turn can benefit from materialist feminism. Uh, Cinzia Arusa's remarks on gender uh, for, the, for Viewpoint magazine in 2014 taxonomized previously existing Marxist scholarship on the patriarchy question as divisible between three theses or schools. Firstly, dual systems theory or triple systems theory proposed uh, historically interconnected systems between patriarchy and capitalism, perhaps proposing womanhood in many cases as a sex class uh, running parallel to classes in the conventional sense. Here, both capitalism and patriarchy, and in some cases white supremacy in more recent scholarship, are considered to be systems of oppression. Patriarchy predates capitalism and has its own logic, which has come into enti entwinement uh, or consubstantiality with capitalism. These arguments are usually associated with Heidi Hartman, Christine Delphi, and Sylvia Walby. Now, for the most part, this strain of materialist feminism is based on Beauvoirian existentialism, framing femininity and masculinity as other and self. The second two schools are more similar. Firstly, the indifferent capital school of Ellen Miskins Wood proposes capitalism as having displaced patriarchy and interacting opportunistically with it on a contingent basis without relying in any logical fashion on gendered oppression. There is no structural basis within capitalism, argues Ellen Miskins Wood, although it inherits and naturalizes these hierarchies, being in this way ideologically invested uh, with the hierarchies which predated it. Finally, Arusa's own position, the unitary theory, is heavily informed by the work of Lisa Vogel in her 1983 monograph, Marxism and the Oppression of Women, where she argues that expanding the definition of social reproduction will allow us to see capitalism as an all-encompassing total social order, uh, which brings about gender depression generation by generation uh, in line with its requirement of labor power. Now it goes unstated in these schools that uh, a presupposition is that patriarchal relations a, or a patriarchal system uh, existed prior to capitalism. And in the latter two schools we see here, the latter two theses, uh, the claim is that capital has since dissolved or subsumed patriarchy, and in the first school that patriarchal systems under capitalism today exists in some historically modified form. Now, I'm not intending to blame Arusa herself uh, for her summary. She's actually a scholar of Platonism. Uh, instead, I would suggest that the patriarchy question was mostly meant to address the circumstances women faced um, today, or at least in the later 20th century. So I see uh, the Byzantine eunuch as a necessary con concrete um, example which bears consideration to see how well any of these three theses hold up. So the Byzantine Empire is a term of convenience to, to use to discuss the later Roman Empire between the refounding of Constantinople uh, and its eventual capture by the Ottomans in 1453, so around a millennia of history. Eunuchs were a feature of imperial life throughout this um, era, the end of the Roman Empire, and continued to serve the imperial court under the Ottoman Empire thereafter in another way, which we won't talk about today. Eunuch was something of an umbrella term. Um, an important thing to note is that the, the word eunuch is, is masculine. Greek is a very gendered language, much as German is. Uh, and the word itself, eunuch, seems to have covered people in a range of situations. For the most part, those termed eunuchs had been emasculated as children, purposefully. Um, adult autocastration uh, had been uh, outlawed by the early church and was rare beyond late antiquity. Uh, finally, and importantly to note, uh, eunuchs also described those who were born eunuchs, uh, that is, those who today would have been declared to have intersex conditions due to having ambiguous genitals after birth, and in most Western hospitals today would receive corrective cosmetic surgery. So, 
uh, quite a difficult category to place by today's standards. Uh, but at the time, they were quite distinctive, lacking beards, wearing distinctive attire, having a tendency to be slender and tall, and uh, affecting certain gender-specific spe gender mannerisms. Uh, Byzantine scholarship is something I'll, I'll run through quickly. Um, firstly, there's been uh, quite a substantial body of historical materialist scholarship which concerns the Byzantine history, including um, research to do with conceptualizing historical materialism and the development of class society as a whole. Particularly, uh, Jairus Bernardi and John Halden have contributed um, landmark works uh, analyzing the tributary mode using uh, material from Byzantine political econ economy. Uh, Peter Saras has also responded to them quite admirably. However, uh, none of these three scholars, and for the most part, historical materialist Byzantinists, have not paid a great deal of attention to gender, except perhaps in passing. As such, uh, scholarship on eunuchs is probably best divided between pre said that is pre-Orientalism thesis writing, uh, and more contemporary uh, social history. Uh, prior to the writing of Edward Said, um, Byzantine scholarship identified the Byzantine Empire as divided between the, the twin essential cultural forces of Hellenic and Oriental aspects. Um, and in this case, eunuchs played a linchpin role. Um, I'm not sure if you can see this quote on the screen by Charles Deal, uh, but here he is, he is describing dramatically um, the, the intrigues which eunuchs would cause and involve themselves with and the, the feminization of the Byzantine court. And this, this was very much how they were perceived. They were perceived as a very oriental feature, being both uh, mutilated and effeminate um, by um, Enlightenment historians and 20th century historians. Um, so this has changed considerably since the late 20th century. And now there's a, a large body of eunuch-specific scholarship and gender um, scholarship for Byzantine history in particular. Most important to note here is Catherine Ringrose, who has um, drawn on uh, cultural, uh, cultural theory um, around gender construction to propose eunuchs as a discrete gender category. So um, a non-dialectical a non but still relational view of uh, eunuchs, which is certainly well worth considering. And I'll be drawing from that for the rest of this talk. Um, and yeah, she presents eunuchs as existing between men and women and their fortunes as tied up with the relationships of courtly men and women. Uh, secondly, Matthew Keffler is as close close as we have to a feminist materialist account of eunuchs, drawing on the works of Judith Butler and gender performativity, contrasting to Ring Rose's gender construction, and Raywin Connell, uh, the prominent Gramscian gender theorist. And uh, Keffler proposes that eunuchs existed uh, as one, uh, one participant in, in the plurality of masculinity and the dialectic of sex. Uh, and Keffler is especially useful for his research on male authors of Roman history and how, the, how they found eunuchs unsettling, which is a point we'll return to in a moment. Uh, finally, some empirical work has been done by Rudolf Gilliard, mostly in the 1990s, um, to do with the courtly position of eunuchs. Uh, this second piece, The Social World of the Byzantine Court, uh, has provided some invaluable uh, history on their fortunes. And finally, Sean Tuffer uh, has written a a voluminous amount of material on uh, the question of eunuchs. Um, yeah, a huge number of articles where he's, he's dealt pretty methodically through all of the primary source material available. So this is what uh, we have to work with as historians. And now I'll make some general comments. Uh, so eunuchs were, of course, part of, part of class society. Um, and we can primarily determine their impact through material written about them by others, especially by full-bodied males. Eunuchs in the Byzantine Empire have left us no written material uh, from their own hand, so there is a certain speechless quality to our accounts of them. Uh, but all the same, it's quite easy to determine uh, the position uh, which they played within society. Uh, we know that in Byzantine society, in contrast to, to the later Western Roman Empire, uh, they were a commonplace. Um, someone living particularly in, in the capital Constantinople would have encountered eunuchs on an everyday basis with their condition not unremarkable, uh, but by no means exceptional. So we can, we can salvage quite a lot about them, which I will 
um, move to thematically now. So Unix uh, and the family, or perhaps it should be Unix and patriarchy. Uh, yeah, so to con contemporary thinkers, Unix seem to appear to be outside of a, a conventional gender dyad. Um, but all the same, uh, for the Byzantines, they were excluded from a key dyadic institution, that is to say marriage. They were forbid forbidden by Roman law predating the Byzantine Empire um, from participating in this, uh, although from the 1720s onwards they were permitted to adopt, um, including adult sons. Um, so there was an access to vertical kinship. Uh, but other than that, they couldn't really participate in what you'd normally expect a man to and couldn't head a household in the conventionally um, expected fashion with children. Um, in its own way, however, this is likely to have played some p positional advantage for them uh, and secured their position as loyal administrators, um, which we will now turn to with regards to the Byzantine state. The Byzantine Empire was an imperial state with Constantinople serving as a center for tribute collection uh, both from the territories con controlled directly by imperial armies and from the neighboring regions, which Obolensky has dubbed the Byzantine Commonwealth, the Macedonians, Bulgarians, Ukrainians, Montenegrins, Serbians, Moldovians, Rus, and the Georgians. Um, the position of the emperor in this role uh, was um, being tasked with dominating these various groups by military force, as you can see in the quote here, and also a religious role. Importantly to note, Eunuchs were ineligible as emperors themselves, without any exceptions, uh, as mutilated men, um, and they were in inappropriate as an embodiment of empire. So, unable to found their own families and unable to serve as emperors, they were taken to be more loyal as members of the Byzantine administrative state. So, the Byzantines didn't consider themselves as having an economy as such. The word economy instead meant it was a ruling virtue, best translated as discretion. However, despite this lack of theorization on their own part, the Byzantine state, we can tell, was comparatively sophisticated, with centralized mints overseeing um, bu bureaucracy, overseeing commercial activity, uh, and taxation on foreign traders by uh, imperial um, powers. Within this system of imperial-centered administration, eunuchs had a privileged role, including having prominent titles reserved for them, such as serving as a chamberlain. Uh, they were not a consistent feature in this respect, with their popularity declining with the rise of provincial dynasticism in the Middle Byzantine Empire, uh, and then recovering for the final 13th to 15th centuries of the empire's existence. Um, they could serve as generals. This is probably the most famous Byzantine image you'll hope to see. You can see that on Justinian's left, uh, there's his tr most trusted general, Nazis, uh, who's a eunuch. So they could also serve in, in this role, particularly useful for insecure emperors such as Justinian. Now, with this said, uh, I should emphasize that there was no straightforward acceptance of eunuchs by Byzantine society, and our male sources uh, routinely exhibit negative views of them. Um, Ringrose's work on this has been particularly sterling, showing how use of the alpha negating pretext was used by Byzantine authors to suggest them being unvirtuous, unmanly, and other, other negative traits, um, demonstrating their, their, their sense of lacking. Okay. Um, Keith Hopkins has suggested that this is equivalent to 17th century and 18th century Jewish administrators in German states, effeminated uh, and disdained yet formally advantaged. One more theme. Um, with regards to eunuchs uh, within the church, they could serve as men insofar as they could perform the divin divine mysteries. Uh, they could perform liturgical roles, ritual roles, which were usually preserved exclusively for men and certainly were not permitted um, uh, for women. Uh, they could also serve as patriarchs, the most famous being Theophylact, Theophylact the 10th century son of Emperor Romanus I, who was castrated unusually in adulthood and placed into that position. Um, and there's been a lot of research done, especially by Evelyn Patlagian, in eunuchs as a liminal figure, uh, as an ambiguous figure, appearing in hagiographical writing, um, particularly as women infiltrating mon male, male monastic spaces, often disguise themselves as eunuchs. Um, so yeah, we're gonna look briefly at one particular example of a, of a figure in class society, Simeon the Sanctified, who by the late 70s uh, had accumulated a large amount of wealth, um, served as a bureaucrat and a former great admiral uh, and then arrived at the usually male-exclusive space of Mount Athos, 
um, perhaps by imperial request, with an entourage of three other eunuchs, Eusebius, Candidos, and Hilarion, who in short order caused great offense at Athos's annual uh, gathering of monastic superiors for their arrogance and beardless appearance, uh, and were then ejected. Thereafter, they petitioned uh, the reigning emperor to return, did so, and then invested an enormous amount, 36 pounds of gold coin, uh, in restoring the monastery of Xenophon. Um, and Rosemary Morris, in her article on this, calls Simeon a classic example of a refounder with obvious friends and patrons in high places. Please take a look at the monastery of Xenophon, and then we'll return to some more high theory. These are, of course, contemporary photos, not from the 11th century. So, previously, Marxist feminism has failed to account for effeminacy or explain it, uh, besides the Gramscian investigations of Raywin Connell. It has been commonly criticizing for having, it's been commonly criticized for having little ability to grasp gendered abuse, from rape to wife beating to street harassment, a failure particularly acute uh, in a light towards definitions of gender, presenting it as a procession of cyclical developmental regulatory violence. It's quite easy to see how um, the latter kind of perspective could include the castration of slaves and the sons of aspirational parents. Um, and I think that Marxist feminism has to demonstrate its superior use here. But I think that this can be done. Marxism has a unique emphasis on contradictions. So far, eunuch scholarship has not been able to present a satisfying answer as to whether eunuchs were men, with their male gendering on the linguistic and often institutional levels, um, or whether they were third gender given their unmistakable, unmistakable phenomenological particularity. We've just seen Simeon's beardless state, Simeon and his coterie, beardless state causing um, offense at Mount Athos. I'd propose here that a solution to this problem is neither po possible nor necessary. Eunuchs were particularized through a mesh of contingency, convention, and custom, much like any other gender. To swiftly return back to the three theses, um, both dual systems or sex class approaches sourced to emphasize patriarchal relations as trans-historical. The indifferent approaches and the unitary approaches uh, outlined or grouped by Arusa are uh, founded on the particularity of capital and its social order, which is taken to be distinctive to earlier eras, and proposes oppression appearing as an ad hoc, non-systemic, and non-autonomous, crucially a non-autonomous um, feature of society. Now, I'll repeat my point. This would seem to suggest that uh, there was a systemic patriarchy which existed in tributary mode economies, such as the Byzantine Empire, um, if not a consistent one, then at least a, a reliable, systematically analyzable one. So I'm going to question whether exactly that's true, uh, because I think that whatever conclusions are reached about gender's contemporary form, whether capitalism is entwinning or has subsumed um, patriarchy, if we can even use the word, um, we shouldn't base it on conflationary displacement uh, of um, of our own gender relations as, as distinguished from something which preceded them. This seems to assume rather than explain. And so the question here is, is it analytically helpful to say that a patriarchal system prevailed in the Byzantine Empire? And I'm going to offer a tentative no to that question, and particularly uh, to the notion of there being any single patriarchal logic uh, in force. Regardless, eunuchs are demonstrative of the contradictory variations thrown up by tributary mode societies and cannot be overlooked as historical subjects, albeit a defunct one. Historical materialism is well equipped to recover a history of eunuchs and other non-dianic subjects which existed prior to colonialism and now after it. But this demands a, a wider, this demands a wider comparative casting of the net than previously existing historical theorization of patriarchy, including Marxist theorization of patriarchy, has tended towards. To satisfactorily answer the question, what has capitalism done to gender, we must, of course, ask history how gender was marked out before it. Thank you.